when uh, Brevard Childs uh, came out with his canonical criticism in the in the late 70s, uh, people began to to look at the Psalms as a book. Uh, for years, people have read the Psalms as an anthology, but you began to see individuals start to sort of take a moment and say, well, is there some value to looking at the Psalms as a book? Um, and even before Childs, Klaus Westermann suggested that Psalm 1 was placed there on purpose as, as a, a chance to uh, provide, as I've said before, hermeneutical spectacles to read the rest of the Psalter, that Psalm 1 is going to set this tone of, of Torah as you go through. Um, Clint McCann um, certainly followed that and suggested that Psalm 1 reflected that theme of Torah through the entire Psalter, that Psalm 1, Psalm 19, Psalm 119 all focus on the importance of, of Yahweh's instruction, Yahweh's Torah. Um, even Klaus Westermann believed that at one time the Psalter ended at Psalm 119. Uh, we haven't got any manuscript evidence for that, but it's an interesting theory. Uh, McCann and James Mays also believed that um, the Psalter is not promoting uh, Davidic monarchy as it on the surface might seem to, but it's actually Yahweh's sovereignty that's promoted all the way through. Uh, that the Lord reigns is found at the end of book two and the end of book three, all the way throughout book four and all of the doxology psalms, and, and Yahweh's reigning over Israel is actually the, the theme of the book of psalms and reading it as a book. Um, Brueggemann actually took the reading it as a book a, a step further. Walter Brueggemann finds a, a theological progression of a, of a journey of faith from Psalm 1 uh, to Psalm 150 where Psalm 1 expresses some naive obedience, that, that retributive justice Deuteronomic theology, you know, do good, you get blessed, do bad, you get punished, all the way through to what he calls naive praise in Psalm 150, where God is worshipped, not for anything we get out of it, but just simply because, uh, maybe that, that growth toward disinterested piety and, and this desire to, to worship God just for who God is. The turning point of that for, for Brueggemann, for him, is Psalm 73, that that's the moment when you move uh, you start moving away from expecting reward from God for faith and moving toward simply trusting uh, even when God doesn't make sense. Others have sort of looked at the Psalms and what I would call micro-canonical concerns, where Brueggemann's kind of taking a macro-canonical approach. Uh, David Howard takes a very micro-canonical uh, approach and spent a great deal of time an analyzing the lexical connections uh, between Psalms 93 to 100. Uh, and demonstrates uh, a lot of shared vocabulary and connections between the psalm, and, and began suggesting that perhaps these psalms were not just collected together, but but redacted on purpose, that there is a, a, an interpretive purpose as you go through. Uh, but I wouldn't be fair if I didn't offer some counter-testimony on that. Uh, Norman Wybrey uh, disagrees that there's any uh, seeming organization here. He says that the psalms are too diverse, the book of psalms is far too diverse uh, to focus on... Um, on any particular individual theme. Um, he doesn't really uh, honor, in my mind, the connections that Gerald Wilson found between the editing of the Psalter and uh, editing of the Mesopotamian hymn text. Uh, Wilson demonstrated that it seems other cultures edited their hymn books together in, in uh, intentional kinds of ways and suggested that maybe we need to start reading the Psalms as, as edited in an in intentional way. So um, uh, Wybrey says no, uh, that, that's not the case. Um, so as we go through, I want you to, to keep in mind that, that we can read these psalms not just as an anthology, but perhaps also uh, as a book, as telling maybe a little bit greater story.